Welcome, everybody. I am Josiah Neely. I'm a senior fellow here at the R Street Institute. And this is our, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's panel on competitive uh, electricity policy, past, present, and future. Uh, we have a, uh, a great panel uh, with us today to talk about that. People who, uh, you know, have been uh, on the ground or in decision-making roles who have seen um, how some of these policy changes have played out over the past decades and, and what's going on now and what is happening in the future. Uh, electricity policy is a interesting developing field in my view because for a long, long time, uh, the idea of you know, competition and markets, other things in electricity was kind of a theoretical. Um, you you based you kind of had uh, uniformity throughout the states. There was not a lot of competition in the system. That started to change, and particularly over the past few decades, you know, we now have seen uh, real variation among uh, different parts, uh, regions, states of the country, both in terms of retail and then also wholesale. All sorts of different aspects of competition. Uh, and elements of competition. So we've we, we've seen how that's played out. Um, there's certainly been a lot of controversy about it. It's continued. So we could talk about talk about that. But we want to talk about you know what's happened and and uh, where we go from here. What's likely to be the the battles ahead. So um, a couple. Uh, I would note just a couple of programming things before I introduce our panel. First, there is we were gonna, we are going to be taking uh, questions from the audience. So there is a Q and A feature there uh, where you can submit the questions. Uh, and I'm told that there is uh, the ability to upvote other people's questions. So if you see a question in the Q&A that you really, really want us to answer, um, we don't have like a super chat fun function where you like pay us money to answer the question, but I, uh, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we will get to it. Um, another thing is this is being recorded and it will be available on our website uh after the session's over so if uh, there are people who you think are interested in the conversation who did not have the opportunity to attend you will be able to send that around to them um so uh with that said i'm going to introduce our panelists um we first uh, we have a we have uh, a number of you know former uh regulators former FERC commissioners. First uh, with us is uh, is Pat Wood, um, who is actually he's been both a, a state and federal electricity policymaker. He was the chair of the Texas Public Utility Commission back in the 90s during the period where Texas was making its transition to competition. And then he was uh, commissioner and chair of the of FERC uh during the the bush administration uh 2001 2005 i believe those those dates are correct he'll correct me um uh following up we have uh another oh and uh, i would say that now you're the ceo of 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 uh hunt energy is that correct you i think you get you energy network. network yep energy network yeah yeah you got a number of hats there um uh next with us we have uh another former for Commissioner and Chair uh, Neil Chatterjee. Uh, he was uh, chair of FERC during the, the Trump administration. Um, and now he is a senior advisor at Hogan Lovells. I, I hope I've pronounced it Lovells right. Um, so welcome, welcome, uh, Chair Chatterjee. And we were going to have uh, another former FERC Commissioner, Nora Brownell, with us. Uh, she is in Portugal, and uh, she was gonna uh, she was gonna phone in from the continent, but uh, there were technical difficulties. So unfortunately, we're not able to have uh, uh, her with us. But we do have, uh, you know, perhaps future FERC chair commissioner Landon Stevens. Uh, yes, who is uh, uh, he's not he's not uh, he's not quite there yet, but he is the director of policy and advocacy with the Conservative Energy Network and uh, has been on the ground in states dealing with a lot of these electricity policy issues. So uh, welcome to you all. Pat, let me start with you. Um, 
you know, because uh, because you were you were you were kind of there. You saw you, you kind of seen both sides at the transition, both the state level and, uh, you know, at the federal level. Wh what do you think? Um, what have we learned from these last you know, 20 years or so of experience of competition in parts of, this, in parts of the country? What, you know, what have we learned that we didn't really know uh, at the beginning? Well, gosh. Well, one thing we've learned is it's hard to undo a century of regulatory status. Um, I mean, we, we were regulated, vertically integrated, regulated utility structure, both publicly and privately owned for a century largely in this country and till the end of the 20th century. And unbundling that as we did with natural gas takes some effort and some thoughtfulness and some authority, which FERC had plenty of on the gas side and has uh, considerably less on the power side, but a very dominant role nonetheless. Uh, another, one thing I learned and I didn't expect it to be so was how quickly the pace of innovation has happened when those preferred or monopoly businesses are kind of invited to sit down and let others participate. Um, I saw that here in Texas. I'm seeing that in the power pools across the country. Just, you know, renewable energy probably being the lowest hanging fruit there is, my gosh, when you, when you actually, you know, clarify how technologies play in a market and how you want to interconnect and pay for their costs and allow them to, to transact. Um, we got in the early days in Texas, a humongous slug of brand new gas fire generation, taking advantage of those clear rules and big welcome mats. And then right on their tails was wind and now solar coming here as well as in the other power pools, Southwest power pool, MISO, you know, all obviously had very strong resource on wind, but it's one thing to have a resource. It's another to actually have the investment to capture it and convert it into electricity. So the, the, <laughs> the decarbonization of the Texas grid, I think, is the one thing I would say I would never have predicted 20 years ago. But it's uh, moving at a torrid pace. And I think, you know, obviously, the, 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 the Texas experience last February of our, of our power supply outages across the, you know, the large grid here were a sobering wake-up call that um, just because we're deregulating subject to uh, open forces, there is still a need for um, the government to make some guardrails. In this case, uh, probably the, the biggest one in Texas was that there was no mandatory minimum standard for win winterization of a grid that really was built for summer peaking. But uh, winterization is the four times in my professional career, Texas has kind of been on the edge. We're all in the winter. So you think we'd have learned our lesson, but um, we didn't get that done. And uh, it's done now, but it's a little late. People died because of that. So I, that's really uh, the, the sobering thing is we are, and I think we all agree on this one, this is a commodity that is so foundational to our way of life, to our lives, to our economy, that it's going to be um, it's going to be a, a public focused entity. So for all of us who wish it would just kind of go the way of telephone or natural gas or all that stuff, it's really bigger than that. And so we've got to expect that people have a seat at the table. Even people we you know may not want at the table, they deserve to be there and deserve to be listened to. And um, you know, I know, Neil, you dealt with that a lot um, throughout your, your career, both in the Hill and at, at FERC, but, you know, the, this is a public commodity, and the sooner we kind of realize that and, does, and, and bring people to, to talk about where we go from here, the collaborative approach is far to be preferred, and I think that's, that's not a lesson we learned. It's one that's actually proven out. Yeah. So, uh, Chairman Chatterjee, yeah. Let me let me throw it to you then. You know, obviously, uh, the the state versus federal jurisdiction and oversight is a little sliced up in turn, You know, you're you're not dealing with uh, with retail issues exactly. You're dealing with hotel, wholesale stuff and and transmission, other things like that. Um, but you have, I think, you know, you came in in a period where. Uh, you know, there had already been uh, uh, some groundwork and experience laid in terms of 
competitive electricity in parts of the country. RTOs, you know, organized wholesale markets in most, but most of the country, but with with uh, you know pretty big areas that still don't have them. Uh, well, you know, what, what is kind of your assessment and perspective in terms of you know uh, uh, what are the issues and challenges that that people were facing and the kind of like uh, Pat Pat talked about you know kind of political forces back and forth, you know, uh, different sort of interested parties. What, what, uh, what's your kind of general assessment as far as what you learned from all that? Yeah, look, I think uh, I want to start off by, you know, commending folks who, who really put this in motion. And Pat was really at the forefront of it, uh, both at Texas and again, uh, when he took his seat at FERC uh, mm -hmm. and was really a pioneer and a leader in moving us in this direction. And um, look, I'm a big proponent and believer uh, in these competitive wholesale markets. Uh, I think uh, competition drives innovation. It drives cost discipline. Um, and we've seen tremendous benefits from these markets for consumers, for the economy, and for the environment. And so um, <laughs> when I took my seat at FERC, you know, I was the beneficiary of some of the fantastic work that had gone on prior to my tenure uh, that had put you know, America in this place where we could take advantage of these markets. Now, we're constantly having to make iterative changes to deal with uh, emerging issues. And I guess the most contentious one that I had to deal with was that really in regards to the conversation around decarbonization, in the absence of any kind of federal legislative action on carbon mitigation, uh, it has really fallen to the states to take action to meet their own decarbonization goals. Uh, I think about 45% uh, of the uh, you know, kind of carbon mitigation strategies and tools that are in place right now are at the state level. And I'm a conservative. Uh, I'm a big believer in states' rights. I think states uh, have a, a, a duty and obligation and a right to pursue decisions about their own local resources and resource mix. But when those state policy decisions come in conflict with the efficient functioning of a market, uh, it, it led to some challenges. Um, and look, I, I'll be the first to admit if there were easy solutions, we would have done them already. And the commission really wrestled with trying to balance these state policies with efficient market function throughout my tenure in a handful of the RTOs and ISOs um, with varying degrees of, uh, of success, challenges, um, uh, and the like. So in, in, in PJM in particular, here you have a massive market spanning 13 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, and you had a situation where certain states were pursuing resources like uh, preserving nuclear power, of which I'm a huge proponent of nuclear power. But the reality is, without state supports, nuclear uh, uh, power was having difficulty getting dispatched. Um, offshore wind, similarly, uh, necessary to help meet decarbonization goals. Uh, but it's expensive and uh, required some state supports. And those actions were impacting other states' resources' ability to be dispatched. And so the commission came in and uh, made a difficult decision over the course of a couple of years in response to PJM coming and telling us that the status quo was untenable. Um, and so we moved with a minimum offer price rule um, and it, it was the source of much consternation. Ultimately, I actually thought the, the auction that was run under the rules that we put in place uh, did not have the, the sort of negative impacts that uh, opponents of the, the MOPR had feared. Uh, that said, stakeholders within PJM uh, have since you know, sort of started to move away from that approach. Uh, similarly, in New England, we approved the, the CASPER proposal. Uh, which was another, you know, complicated construct meant to deal with trying to balance these state prerogatives with the efficient functioning of the market. Uh, in New York ISO, we dealt with buyer side mitigation rules. These were all difficult, difficult choices. And I think, uh, again, I come back to my core point. It's, uh, I don't think these were driven by politics. Uh, it was driven by the reality of what we were facing. And I wanted to see these markets function and succeed. 
towards the end of my tenure, what I found was we were in this real dilemma. There were certain resources, certain states that were openly musing about pulling out of the competitive markets. And I didn't think that was a desirable outcome either. So here I'm confronted with on the one hand, these RTOs are coming to us and saying the status quo is untenable. On the other hand, the actions we took to try and restore some balance to these markets um, were leading folks to contemplate exiting these markets. Neither one were viable uh, so, or positive solutions uh, uh, for, uh, for the economy, for the environment, um, uh, and, and, and for the consumers. And so uh, uh, we really looked for ways to, to try and, and, and thread the needle here. Um, I arrived at the conclusion that I felt that a transparent price on carbon, uh, when compared with these alternative mechanisms, was a vastly superior tool to decarbonize while also maintaining reliability and efficient market functioning. Um, uh, uh, and this was all the result of a, of a, of a pretty long and complex journey uh, that, that dealt with some of the, the challenges of balancing these resources. That was the hard part. There were also some, you know, real positives as well that I'm very proud of. Um, I came to realize that, you know, I mentioned competition drives innovation. Uh, there are some tremendous new technologies from battery storage to aggregated distributed uh, resources that I thought had the capacity to provide further uh, benefits to, to consumers and to these markets. Uh, but the existing uh, framework within the RTOs and the ISOs you know, kind of put up some artificial barriers that prevented these resources from being compensated for all of their attributes, for capacity, for energy, and for ancillary services. And so we had two pretty significant FERC orders during my tenure, FERC order 841 regarding storage and, and FERC order 2222 regarding uh, aggregated DERs, uh, removing the barriers to entry to enable those resources to be compensated for all of their attributes actually, you know, I actually think will be some of the most significant actions the commission could have taken um, to address, you know, some of the, the ways to, to innovate uh, within the market. We're closely with a lot of folks who I see on the participant list and at R Street on this. I believe this is a conservative approach to energy policy, to promote free markets, to promote competition, to remove barriers to entry for new technologies. And so, uh, you know, I'm proud of the approach that we took at the commission. It wasn't always pretty. We didn't always get it right, um, but uh, uh, we did our best to, to kind of, you know, promote the, the saliency of these markets. Okay, very, very good. Uh, Landon, let me, let me uh, throw it to you just for a second. I know, um, you know, you obviously have been working a lot at uh, the state level uh, in Arizona and other places um, so uh, what is, what is, from a, from, you know, we've, we've gotten a kind of, uh, uh, policymaker, regulator, you know, uh, perspective from the non-governmental, you know, from seeing things from the outside, what's, what's your perspective in terms of, you know, how things, uh, have played out and what the conversation is like over, uh, competitive electricity at this point? Yeah. Well, um, again, th thanks for having me on here. Um, unfortunately, I too am a recovering regulator, so I I, I, was, didn't, I didn't want to out you, but uh, <laughs> I came to CEN uh, from the Arizona Corporation Commission. So looking at this from a state level, and so as Neil and Pat were saying, there's so much wrapped up into the policy making and the regulation behind electricity. Um, just the decades of history of how it's how it's been generated. And what makes that even more difficult is you get these regional and these local identities that are actually forged around a certain technology or form of generation and a certain business structure and way of doing things. And so as Pat said, things are very entrenched. And you know, it's like turning the Titanic when we want to make some of these, some of these changes. It's it's not as quick as we would like sometimes. At the same time, uh, I do think we're at an interesting point as I work in the states. Um, you know, we work across the country in uh, 25 different capitals across the country on energy issues. And you do have sections of the country that, you know, aren't in these markets yet, um, looking at the West and the Southeast specifically. 
Um, and I think it lends itself to some interesting opportunities to uh, build off of some of the topics that Neil was talking about uh, and take advantage of this technology innovation. I think a huge driver is our ability to gather and collect data and how do we leverage that to determine um, what a what a good regulatory structure looks like moving forward. And I'm I'm pretty optimistic. I think we have a great opportunity in some of these areas to, um, you know, not just go and pick, you know, PJM or MISO and pick a model and then, you know, rubber stamp it down in some of these areas, but to create something new, maybe an RTO 2.0, if you will, and kind of look at how do we how do we do this in a way that leverages all of the tools that are that are out there today um, and learn from you know some of those structures that have held this up in the past and so when we're looking out you know i'm in arizona as you said um, and i know out here in the west we have a lot of utilities and a lot of um, organizations looking at that exact question how do we do this uh you know the elephant in the room is uh more of a, a governance structure issue when you're trying to balance this federalist state by state approach and then kind of patch patch that into a, a regional quilt, if you will. Um, and especially, you know, for, for Western governors, I think California's the elephant in the room. Um, and how do we deal with that? And so there's there's many ideas. And I think as Pat was saying, it'll it'll take some work to to figure that out. But um, I think one thing that is clear, um, especially we've seen it even in the incremental steps of a, an energy imbalance market out here in the West, when you implement any forms of, of competitive market structures, um, you're going to see those benefits, whether it's economic, um, as we've seen from energy imbalance, but also uh, on the environmental side. Maybe we don't need to mandate, uh, you know, state by state um, environmental targets if the market structures are correct i think they will respond and do that um, in in their own way um, so i think anytime we're moving in that direction it's it's good and i think we're going to see that more and more now we've got to get into the hard part which is rounding different states up who have different generation profiles who have different customer desires and wants different environmental goals and targets uh, and then patch that all together in a way that maintains reliability, keeps the lights on, keeps costs under control, uh, and keeps, you know, the political, the political class happy as well, because they're going to have to answer for it over the next 15 or 20 years while this gets off the ground. So. Okay. So uh, we do have a couple questions in the chat. First, um, first question is about, uh, you know, the continued, uh political salience relevance of of enron you know i know for a while i think uh the the original push and move towards competition kind of got uh killed off for for a while after the the whole enron uh debacle and so you know there's a question of uh uh to what extent is that still viewed as an impediment to increase competition in some of these states uh anyone yeah i i, I think you know may, maybe people have new uh new boogeymen but uh, uh yeah Pat you know that one that i lived that one you know in real time but you know it, it really fell out of a broader issue in california where there was a you know kind of a lack of sufficient infrastructure and then some rules that you know, even the FERC staff knew were wrong, but because the political class put such pressure on the commission, they agreed to a, a deal that was not balanced. And then there was no oversight. So those three legs of the three-legged stool were all defective there and allowed the uh, folks at Enron uh, to really take advantage of, of either uh, rules that weren't clear are to actually violate rules. So that was on my watch. We got to unpack all that from Enron was the poster child, but there were uh, some big movie stars in that cast as well. So I won't go through the history of naming them all because <laughs> you're picking a stab here, Josiah. But I, you know, I, I think there's always, um, I think the public is always, particularly in this day and age where you've got a conspiracy theory behind every tree for every subject, but 
Um, there's always going to be a skepticism on something that's not transparent. So I do think that that really a solution to build consensus here has got to be start and begin and end with open, collaborative, and transparent. Now that might mean it's a little bit slower, but again, if you bring more people along, then you really win at the end of the day. So I do think that if Enron stands for anything still today, it's that if, if you can't understand it, or if you can't explain it, or if you can't at least present it publicly, then I don't want any part of it. So that really keep, forces people to, you know, we can get all wrapped up into things like that are critical and of importance to business, like interconnection rules and the MOPR and, you know, how customer protections work. But if at the end of the day, a cut the customers, see, the whole point of this thing is for customers, by the way, if we, we tend to forget that. And I'm, I'm kind of the clarion person that reminds us the only reason we do this is so that customers are better off. And if they're not, then we probably need to rethink what we're doing. So Enron clearly proved that when um, there's opacity in the system and there are rules that aren't clear and you don't have a cop on the beat, bad stuff happens, just like happens in any major city with regular crime. So that that really, again, triggers a role for government that some of us on the right don't love. But we got to remember that, you know, um, rights are secured for men and women, and they've got to be protected. And so that protection comes as a role of the state to put the guardrails around a system and ensure that the system serves all. And that's not, that that's a good American place to land. Um, that's really consistent with our constitutional past and our present. So I'm, I'm never apologized to that in front of crowds like this one that, you know, or where I am ideologically, but, you know, we, but we also can't take it too far. We've got to make sure that we don't over-regulate and that we don't really suppress the the innovation that, um, you know, Enron did do some good things. It's not just like they're this evil empire that just, you know, wreaks pollution. It, there were some very creative approaches to trading and, and transparency that they did embrace. And so we, we need to make sure that we take the good and uh, reject and consciously, you know, purge the bad from those kind of ideas. But it's still around, but not really by name anymore, except maybe here in Houston, but um, a lot of people still, you know, suffered from that. Obviously, a lot of employees got their IRAs wiped out, and so there's some thin skins here, but, you know, I don't see in doing that, and talking about these things around the country, it's really more of an older crowd. I mean, Neil, you're probably a little baby when all that happened, but uh, anyway, we I, I got my gray hairs from that one. Just to build on that, though, Pat, because you, you touched on some important things, including the importance of having a cop on the beat. And, and I think, look, you know, I'm a conservative. I, I'm with Pat. I, I don't believe in over-regulation. And, and some of this stuff makes me not, uh, you know, queasy sometimes. But, you know, we have to have adequate enforcement in order to ensure the integrity of our markets, right? In order to encourage market participation, you have to have confidence that the rules of those that the market will be enforced. And I, and I think enforcement has worked. And I also think compliance programs have worked. I think that, so to the core of the question, which was, is Enron still a boogeyman that's spooking people away from markets? I actually think, you know, enforcement at FERC coupled with, you know, really robust compliance programs, which a significant amount of investment was put into among stakeholders has provided that assurance. And so that I can say, at least during my tenure at the commission, um, I did not see the specter of, of Enron or a lack of confidence uh, in markets uh, emerge uh, uh, quite in the way that the, the question was presented. Okay, good. All right. So here we have another question about uh, what, you know, impact of weather, uh, particularly, you know, we have seen recently uh, a number of different, you know, uh, weather disruptions to the grid. And so this is a question of whether uh, you know, weather related impacts, particularly in rural areas, might lead to uh, degridding uh, rural towns, other electricity consumers trying to trying to go off the grid through some combination of wind, solar, battery, microgrids, that sort of thing. Does anyone have a, a perspective or, or thoughts on that? I mean, that's that's the world I'm in for my day job today. I mean, I, I do think that resilience um, at the edge is kind of a under 
resourced part of our power system and needs to be done just for that purpose. Again, the last February kind of accelerated my feelings for that as a Texan looking out at a at a power free Texas for a few days. It was a pretty arresting uh, event for me professionally. And I really thought at that point, we've got to make sure that what this questioner points out really comes to be that we set up a system that's not just strong from the center, but that's strong all around the grid. And so those microgrids, those area, of course, I'm playing at this distribution level with batteries right now, but the, the coordination of those things that were in your question, Josiah, were, were just exactly, I think, where, where capital is flowing. I mean, I'm not having any problem getting calls returned on that, on investing in that area. So I, uh, I, think, that's, I think that's what we did, honestly, way back when, uh, when we kind of did small generator interconnection standards back at PUC and at FERC. And then, of course, those were doubled down in a major way by Neil, but is bet on the big grid and bet on the small grid so that we've got that double resiliency. Because, again, we, we don't, as I, again, emphasize what happened for us in Texas last year, we don't have the luxury of, of just having a system that's kind of, you know, works most of the time. Um, we've got so much dependent on it working all the time. And like a telephone network that if you cut it here, it reroutes immediately and moves the data traffic in a different direction because it's redundant. Um, that kind of resiliency um, at the edge of the grid is, I think, the future. Yeah, I'll I'll build on that just a little bit. I, I think Pat's right. I, you know, I do think they're, especially with the way that renewable energies are taking off and and growing, um, there will be a need for rethinking or, or building out of, you know, kind of your high voltage transmission infrastructure. I think that will increase as well. You'll, I would like to see uh, more ties between regions. Um, I don't know if Texas will ever let that happen, Pat, but, uh, you know, out here in Arizona, part of our problem is we're completely disconnected from any Eastern interconnection ties. And so uh, even one or two you know, their major investments and who's going to pay for that, you know, that's the, the question. But um, I think that can unlock a lot of these resiliency kind of redundancy uh, options that you're talking about. But at the same time, there will be local options where it makes sense. And I think part of that is making sure the, the market is, the markets are set up in a way that they don't keep innovation out before they have the, the room to grow and, and, and build. Because, you know, I was at uh, National Hydropower Week this week in DC, and they were showing off this, they called it distributed hydro technology, where they literally drop these <laughs> micro turbines into farmers' canals and can power, you know, whole, whole farms that are completely isolated off of the canal system that they have. You know, there's innovation out there that's going to grow and build. And I think we need to make sure the markets are set in a way that allows for that to, to take place. Now, they might not all come to fruition, but local people, I mean, markets will find a way to allocate resources where they make sense. And whether that's isolated on the edges uh, or through more interconnection and, and transmission, it, it'll happen. So just to briefly build on that, Landon, we were highly intentional uh, in designing for quarter 22-22 to be flexible, to account for the fact that there may be innovations that we can't even contemplate today. And so we specifically built in flexibility into the order to allow for, for some of this innovation to have the opportunity to thrive. Yep. Yeah, uh, let me ask, it's just so we do have a, a question on order 22-22. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, if the guests considered whether FERC 2222 participation of DR uh, in wholesale markets is a better idea than establishing a market at the distribution level for DR? Uh, and, and can those, can or should those coexist? I don't know if, uh, if any of y'all have thoughts on that. If not, we can go on. I, well, hold on, I do. I know I do. Let me just wait. I must, uh, but I'm looking for that. 
Yeah, yeah there's, oh, there's, there's that question. It's at the bottom because people it's at the bottom. Yeah, great question. I, I went out of order just because it was because. Uh, yeah, yeah. We were talking about 22, 22. Yeah. You know, that's a great question. And I, I think about that a lot because of what I'm doing. Um, there's a there's a virtue to having and again I'm I'm the author of best standard market design but there's a virtue to having kind of a more comprehensive set of rules that that work to allow businesses to to you know flourish for customer benefits so you know part of me leans toward yes have that be enabled at the RTO level but you know then the question that David asked is should we instead have individual markets arise at the distribution level? You know, I'd like to think that you could in fact have, and, and, and again, my, my thought is that it should not only be centered around the utility, but it should be centered around private networks. I mean, look at the internet. We kind of built it on the back of the AT&T network, which was a government sponsored monopoly that, you know, wired the continent. Um, but over time, it wasn't really replaced. It was kind of built on top of with, you know, this, you know, internet broadband or this, actually it was the MCI first with the, with the microwave technology and then other networks just kind of built and that same network stayed on the bottom. And of course it's morphed and changed over time too. I kind of think that the electricity does the same thing that we have, you know, networks of customer and load and, storage and all these new things that we didn't have back when I was trying to make this all kind of work in Texas, you know, to have those markets coexist as the, as David uh, Erickson asked in this question, I do think it, it collapses into that, but there needs to be some sort of governance so that really the, the costs of doing transactions in these much more disaggregated networks don't really swallow the savings. And that's really what standard market design was about at the wholesale level was to really try to get all the the BS stuff that is a di it's distinctions that really don't make a difference, but that run up costs to just get out of the way. And so if we could standardize the way things worked across the country, then we'd, we would have 10 or 15 national retailers of electricity that would have brought a lot of benefit. So I'm still hoping for that day, but I really think we've now moved on technologically to this more distributed level. And I think the same philosophy would hold there that let those different business plans work, but but tie them together in a way that we have to for reliability. This is a quick little sidebar, but I'd like to see FERC act on the DR opt-out. I think it's time. I think innovation has moved to such a point. Um, while I was still at the commission, uh, I had actually called to move to a final rule. Uh, the commission went a little slower, started with an NOI. It's been sitting for a little while. Uh, I'd love to see FERC act on, uh, I think it was 2222B, uh, on the DR opt out and, uh, and 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 kind of move us into the 21st century on these issues. Okay, um, so here's a here's a bigger picture question. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, uh, you know, conservatives uh, tend to like uh, free markets, right? Uh, uh, part of general conservative, you know, principle and ideology. But it has been noted that. Uh, with the, with some exceptions, like in Texas, uh, red states have maybe uh, lagged a little bit behind. If you look at uh, you know states that have uh, retail choice, so most of them are probably in bluish areas of the country. And then even with the RTOs, the parts of the country that are not in RTOs, uh, you know, you got in the southeast or in the west, uh, some more red states. So, what is it? Uh, you know, how do you make the case for competition to some of these red states, sort of our, uh, you know, audiences that the utility monopoly model is maybe not uh, the way to go, uh, uh, you know, in terms of conservative principle? Yeah, I, I think there's a real opportunity here. Look, I'm, I'm a conservative. I'm a Republican from Kentucky who worked for Mitch McConnell and was appointed chairman of FERC by, by Donald Trump. But I'm a big believer in markets and, and in the benefits of markets. And I would like to see greater market expansion and a greater focus on it. Um, I think the Southeast did at least take a step in the right direction with, uh, with SEAM to move towards a market. Uh, I am seeing interest uh, you know, across the country uh, uh, in potentially 
looking at market expansion, I'll note there was, I think, $19 million in the president's budget to study, you know, uh, uh, RTO participation uh, and its benefits. Uh, and I'm hoping to see some momentum there. I, I do want to clarify, ironically, it's it's not necessarily a red state or, or blue state thing. Um, I think FERC could be more muscular in this area, but one of the reasons the commission has not is, and I don't think this was any kind of strategic development, it's just a total random outcome that most of the senators on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which is the committee that FERC nominees have to go through for confirmation, are from non-RTO states. And so that <laughs> in a strange way has had a limiting effect of, of, of FERC acting in this regard because it's not just Republican senators, there's Democratic senators who also have some reticence about this. I'm hoping we can make some progress. You know, I know uh, there've been a lot of productive conversations amongst Western governors, um, you know, uh, uh, perhaps looking to, to move in this regard. I believe there is a conservative case to be made for market participation. This is too simple, but you know, conservatives love it when new technologies come in and, and upend you know, existing markets. We like when Uber comes in and breaks up the taxi unions. Uh, but for some odd reason, when it comes to electricity, we're like, oh, that, nope, nope, this is how we've been doing it for 125 years. We have to continue to do it in this manner. Um, I, I think that's an, an outmoded way of thinking. And I'm optimistic that um, more and more conservatives and more and more conservative states uh, are going to embrace uh, the benefits of, of free market competition. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add to that, you know, we work in, like I said, states all across the country, specifically addressing this question on what does a conservative reform look like? Uh, and we actually just put out a study with the University of Texas, uh, kind of an electric competition scorecard for all of the states across the country. And part of the problem is, I think, uh, at least in probably most lawmakers and, and commissioners eyes, but especially in the public, they think of there's two options. You've got Texas on one side, you know, completely deregulated, uh, open retail markets, everything. Uh, and then you've got like your traditional, you know, Florida, Alabama, like vertically integrated monopoly structure on the other side. Uh, and those are your only two choices. And so we tried to frame it as, you know, there's actually this continuum of competition. There are policies and, and regulations and, and different innovations you can add between those two points uh, that can, you know, inject some competition into some of these uh, some of these states, even if you don't eliminate the monopoly structure. You know, when monopolies, uh, when the utilities have to build new generation or new power plants, for instance, you know, are there regulations in place that say, hey, all sources are going to be treated equally when they come to this to this bid. If they can meet these requirements, they can be they can play the game. Or does the utility just kind of get to limit the field from the get go of who can be considered? You know, um, are those uh, auctions or or um, processes overseen by third party, an independent moderator, you know, to make sure that they're handled in a neutral way uh, so that market forces can carry out. You know, I think that's part of it is that, hey, we can take baby steps that are adding competition to the market structures we have. We don't have to throw everything out and start over. Uh, but like I said, there are some areas where I think you have a, a some interest in doing that. You know, you've got Nevada, uh, and Colorado, for instance, that their states have said, hey, you need to join an RTO. I don't know how they can do that <laughs> if nobody else around them wants to play. It'd be an awkward RTO uh, to just have Colorado and Nevada. You know, how that works is we'll, we'll see. But I think it's pushing that discussion out there, like I said. Um, and so now it's a matter of what do those look like. But it, it is this interesting uh, disconnect, as Neil was saying, that somehow, you know, Standing up for the utility is pro-business, uh, according to a lot of Republican uh, lawmakers. Uh, but what they're failing to see is, well, you're just standing up for that one business at the expense of, you know, how many industrial, commercial, retail, other businesses all rely on energy and, and electricity that maybe are getting the short end of the stick when we when we take that approach. So. Um, I think we just need to find the the, the way forward and, and change that way of thinking. But it it is more difficult than 
than it seems. I come back to Pat's point about consumers first. I think that's the case that has to be made uh, is, is this is in the consumer's interest. Uh, and uh, look, uh, you know, I wish we'd gone further in the Southeast, but I also understand I'm from there, the reluctance to engage uh, uh, in, in markets there. Um, uh, but I think as we see exercises like this and we can continue to highlight the benefits of market participation, highlight the consumer case, um, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll continue to see progress in this regard. You know, and you hate, you hate to always prove it with the negative, but I mean, I think you've just got to, you've got to keep the spotlight on what happened in South Carolina, what happened in Mississippi, what's going on in Georgia right now with these undisciplined investments that are being made in markets with no price transparency. There's no, I'm not trying to throw the regulators under the bus because they didn't have anything really to compare those two when they were pricing, whereas none of that stuff would have ever gotten built in a competitive market where people had to, you know, procure with all source solicitations and think about how to procure their future supply. But yet we got, we got a lot of fuel supply diversity in PJM and very resource constrained New England, certainly in all the rest of the markets where you've got markets. So I think the spotlight has to be on what, what attributes come from not getting into the crony capitalism world that, that you know, some Republicans can kind of convince themselves is, is the chamber of commerce way to do things. It's not. It's, it's monopolies which are antithetical to, you know, kind of governance of free people. But we implemented them because at, at the time, we viewed that this was a natural monopoly. Well, now we know that generation is not a natural monopoly by any chance. Retail provision of service is just a political decision. Wires business is, I think, could arguably be at least an oligopoly. But, you know, it's a product that moves at the speed of light. So probably still makes sense that much like natural gas, you keep that part regulated but let the rest go. Um, you know, I, I do see, and I'll just pivot because it fits here, uh, Josiah, but um, Eric asked a question about that the prices haven't flowed through in competitive markets. Wholesale is relentlessly competitive. I can tell you how relentlessly competitive it is here in ERCOT. And I do think that that is incumbent on states that care about getting the customer benefits to the customer that they set up market rules that allow for retail competition to flourish. Because I can tell you a classic example of that was after the freeze, there are all these costs and we do, you know, Texas is wide open, but we have some large regulated um, pockets in there in the city of Austin, San Antonio, the, the rural cooperatives are all vertically integrated with a few exceptions of people who've opened up to competition. And all those customers are bearing the big shellacking of costs from the, you know, spike in gas prices. Um, if, the, if the legislature hadn't intervened and it required some cost to be socialized over the next 50 years and, and uh, for customers, everybody in the competitive arena would have paid zero. Now they're paying about 20% yeah. of what the customers in San Antonio were paying. But you know, the side-by-side -side in a regulated market is worth looking at in a, in a, high, in a heterogeneous market, I should say. The side-by-side -side of who pays and how the costs get done. But it, it, the prerequisite for Eric's question, the prerequisite is that you set up competition to be successful and to be truly competitive where you get rock bottom pricing. If, if NRG wants to set a big price here for most people in Houston, there's going to be three or four people under them that are much more nimble and can take a lower margin and be happy with that as, as an investable business. And that's how you get competition to work. But you can't have these preferences that just persist beyond um, the splitting up of utilities, which I think a lot of states unfortunately did do by keeping the utility uh, distribution company unit in a preferred position that therefore thwarted retail competition in those states, which is why you don't get the flow through of prices is if you don't have price pressure on you from beside you and below you as a competitor nipping at your heels, you'll never be forced to cut the rate. Yeah, I, I think uh, last February, the San Antonio utility, they got in trouble because they they tweeted something about how, uh, don't, don't worry, we're gonna make you pay everything back uh, over a period of years, but that's the system, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta pay for it. 
Um, okay, so it's we do the, have the reg. It's the regulated system. It's the regulated not the, system. Yeah, yes. that's not Texas. Yeah, but you're right. Right. If you're in a regulated system, that's that's the way it works. Um, okay, so we do have a question about uh, batteries. How will declining battery costs affect FERC regulation, in particular pricing of transmission on a demand charge basis? When you have uh, individual utilities that that might be able to, to use that to reduce their transmission capacity needs. Uh, I don't know if any of the panelists have thoughts on that. Uh, so. We live it. Um, it, it. It is very attractive. I, I'm just until recently was on the board of SunPower, which is a solar company. But there's a and there's a number of friends on the call who are in who work with industrial clients and customers. There's a big business in trying to avoid the allocation of regulated charges to your business. And those charges have, the regulator has to pick something. So in Texas, we pick the four critical peaks in the summer, which is now a joke since we're a winter peaking system basically. But FERC always did a 12 CP, which looked at the, the critical peak every month and said, well, based on who was using it at that peak, that's how we're allocating costs. There are whole shops of people across the city of Houston that are really good at figuring out when is that going to peak so that I can be off the grid. And batteries, you used to could be off the grid by turning your processes off. Now you can be off the grid by just turning your battery on, which is a little bit easier. And I think that's where the, the question is going is that you've got this ability now with technology to kind of rate arbitrage the way we do rates. I think as always, this happened on the telephone side too where you do the, the night minutes and the day minutes, and then people would set up a phone shop in India so you could really arbitrage the, the timing there. And, you know, I, I love the creativity of people and the regulator is always gonna be uh, not as fast. So there will be people out ahead and that's what's going on here with, I think, uh, rate design, uh, 12 CP, 4 CP, whatever CP you pick, you're gonna be behind the arbitrageurs. So, let them continue to do it. But I think regulators, um, you know, shouldn't be shellacked when they call people, when they blow the BS meter and say, we're going to change this. I think that change needs to be gradual because a lot of time people have contracts based on the old way of doing things. But, um, you know, that's not, uh, uh, you know, when people are jumping on um, the regulators for uh, changing how solar tariffs work or net metering, I mean, I don't like it. I don't like what they're doing either. But it's not unfair. They are doing their job. They're trying to allocate costs based on cost and currents. So let's figure out how to you know, do rate design more correctly. But, you know, the opponents of that are pretty good at shaping things. The status quo is hard as hell to bust. I mean, we talked about that, I think, at the top of this call. That is true on, on these uh, reform issues with regard to, to batteries and 4CP and 12CP and what have you. All right, I think we have time for we'll, uh, maybe one more question. Uh, so if one, uh, thoughts on interconnection reform, notes, uh, question notes that the average time to interconnect has kind of doubled over the past decade, 3.5 years. What, uh, what, what can be done about that, uh, if anything? Hmm. I, I, <laughs> I guess as the godfather of the interconnection standardization, I'd say, gosh, we won, but what a win. <laughs> it's, a, it's a freaking messy win, isn't it? I hear about that in the other states as well. I, I don't think it's quite as bad down here. I, and I don't honestly know the answer as to why ERCOT's better on that. I do think the lines are similarly long. Um, you've got a lot of resources. It's great that people, uh, you know, that the market's so competitive that people are zooming in. I know there's some, some rule changes that are being proposed at the RTOs um, before FERC that might streamline this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, you've got to do modeling and modeling means staffing and that all means money. And, you know, there's a lot of cost pressure on the RTOs to manage their budgets downward, certainly through the, re the recession that was caused by COVID. So um, I do sense that, and it's hard to get, honestly, and I'm seeing this here, it's hard to hire people that can do that sort of modeling. It's a very, it's a very important skill and you've got to do it for liability. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're not going to get to this decarbonized future anytime soon if you, the first step out of the door is into a big old pad of, pot of mud, which is the slow interconnection process. You don't even make it to your car. So let's change that. 
by probably hiring and getting the right people. But I mean, that starts with colleges. That means you've got to you got to make sure that people are being trained, you know, men and women to do this kind of work and do it early and kind of get a farm team through the educational system because it will be for the next century. We will have these interconnection that they're not going away. It's not just a surge. I think it's the biggest issue we face, right? I mean, there's all this potential for decarbonization, uh, new resources, you know, getting money to more flexible resources. But if we can't get through the queues, then it's all for naught. And, and, and so I think, um, uh, to me, it's, it's the most critical area of focus uh, in the power sector for the foreseeable future. Hey, one thing I would add to, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is a, you know, which is unfortunate because the times are creeping up on interconnection um, approvals. What you're seeing is a lot of developers and, and projects that eh, maybe they're on the margins of, you know, whether they're actually going to be going through or, you know, they're really ready for prime time, but they're like, well, I better get in the queue now because, uh, you know, I've got yeah. a year or more to wait. And, uh, and, and in that meantime, they're taking up a spot for a project that may be shovel ready, you know, at the get go, and then uh, they get the numbers back and they don't they don't pencil and, you know, it, so I, I think part of it, you know, we, we need to figure it out and, and what that looks like, but it, it's, it's kind of spiraling against itself at this point, so. All right, well, uh... Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry uh, to those who asked questions that we didn't get to. We had a lot of, lot of good uh, questions and discussion in the chat. Uh, it was a very good conversation. Uh, you know, uh, yesterday as I was uh, preparing for this panel, I found out that uh, that I uh, finally got COVID. Uh, which don't don't worry, I'm told I can't transmit it to you through your video screens, but. <laughs> Uh, Devin, you know, when I, I told him that I uh, ha had it, he said, well, do you need me to fill in as moderator or whatever? It's like, actually, I don't want to miss this. I think, uh, you know, so it was a very good conversation. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of the participants for asking good questions. And I definitely want to thank the panelists um, for providing their insights, a good back and forth and discussion. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, this will, this is recorded. Uh, it will be up on our website if you want to share it with other people. Um, but uh, with that, unless anyone else has anything pressing, I think I will call it. That's the end. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks, all. Thank you all. Good to see you all.